chapters of Scripture for which two things are not from which two things are not normally found. Uh, you don't normally find someone saying, "I found my life's verse in Nehemiah chapter three." It's not normally from this chapter. Another thing you don't normally find nowadays is people saying, "Yes, I named all of my children." from the list of names in Nehemiah chapter 3. Not necessarily the best choice for names of children, although there are plenty to choose from here in Nehemiah 3. If you haven't read through Nehemiah chapter 3, what you're going to find is it is a list of names of people who worked on and repaired the wall of the city of Jerusalem. I've heard it this week likened to, uh, well not just this week, but in the past, I've heard it likened to uh, almost to the credits at the end of the movie. And the reality is, there's only two reasons that you'd sit through the credits at the end of a movie. One, maybe it's a Marvel movie and you're sure there's another scene at the end, so you wait through to make sure you don't miss something. Or two, you or someone you know was in there and you're waiting to see their name. Otherwise, we skip those. We don't pay much attention. And this is one of those chapters in God's Word that it's easy for us to say, oh, names, <laughs> on to the next, and skip it and not pay much attention. But there are some things worth considering here for you and for me today. You know, it was back in about 2004 that uh, I actually preached through the book of Nehemiah the first time. And on that Sunday morning, we opened the scriptures and I read chapter 3 in its entirety from the pulpit with all the names. I'm not going to do that this morning. It's not a wrong thing to do, but to give you a little bit of a flavor for where we're going, could we look at verse 1 together? Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even to the tower of Maah. They sanctified it to the tower of Hananiel. And next to him built the men of Jericho. And next to them built Zakur the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz, and next unto them repaired Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, and next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Baana, and next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired. You kind of get the idea? Nehemiah is working in kind of counterclockwise fashion around the length of the wall at that point. And again, as we start to read through these names, we don't know these people. And the names aren't good, solid, easy to pronounce names for us. We don't find Bill and Fred and and Jim. They're hard for us to pronounce and it's easy to skip through. But I love the fact that God doesn't. I love the fact that God includes these names for us. And I wonder what that would have how that might have impacted those who would read this at a later time. I don't know how, how much longer after uh, these events, Nehemiah's memoirs would have been available or how widely. But what would it have been for someone who had been part of that project to read back and see their name? What would it have been for a son, a grandson, to be able to look at this and read a name and say, I know him. He was part of something and part of something worthwhile. And how awesome is it for you and for me to know as we look at a chapter like this that every one of these names is known personally, by their God. And not only that, but the names not mentioned here belong to people who are equally known and valuable to the Lord their God. It reminds me of what the writer to Hebrews told us, that we should not forget that God is not unfaithful. He will not forget your work and your labor of love. Paul told us to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Chapters like this in the Bible, while hard for us to read, are great reminders of that truth. But that leads us back to our bigger question and our bigger discussion, our bigger thought for this time in Nehemiah. 
the concept, the idea of rebuilding a life. We've mentioned that every one of us will come at some point to a time of rebuilding, and sometimes that's a positive time. Moving from one good job to another good job, perhaps a better job, and we're rebuilding, starting again in a new place with new good circumstances. Sometimes it's a tragic rebuilding. We've said goodbye to someone close, and we have to figure out what life looks like from here. We've seen that marriage go from bad to worse, and now we're in separate addresses. And what do we do from here? We've seen those children into whom we've poured our lives grow up and become adults and make choices contrary to God and contrary to his word and as a mom, as a dad seeking to continue to trust the Lord and continue to try to cry out to God and, 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 and try not to constantly blame myself for what I did or didn't do but asking God to do a work in their heart while I seek to find my place in their life in a way that honors God these times of rebuilding can take a variety of shapes for each of us. But one of the things that we're reminded of here is that, as we prayed earlier, the rebuilding that takes place in my life and in yours has to be built on the right foundation. And what can happen, in fact, where we start, is that I am the main character in the story of my life. And all of you, congratulations, have the privilege of being extras and maybe even supporting cast in the story of my life. Aren't you lucky? And reality is we kind of look at the world that way, don't we? But one of the things we're reminded of here is that God wants you and me to understand, no, you are not the main character in the story of your life. We have the privilege of participating in the story of the God of the universe. This is his story. And he has a place for you in his story for his purpose, for his glory. Could we consider today looking at Nehemiah chapter 3? I'd I'd, I'd love to uh, title our, our observance today, Teamwork. Not the best title, but it, it is one, so... We'll take it. But that's exactly what we see as we look at Nehemiah chapter 3. Can I remind you how we got to Nehemiah chapter 3? Go back up to Nehemiah chapter 2. As Nehemiah has come into the city of Jerusalem, which is the visible, physical representation of the glory of God for the nation of Israel and for the world at that time, and the city is broken down, the walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire, the city is a reproach. That means it's a laughing stock. It's something that people look at and and shake their heads and, and, and pay no attention to and give no respect to. And if this is supposed to be a representation of the person of the God of Israel, well, he must not be much of a God. And when Nehemiah heard about the state of the city, Even after years of people having gone back to repopulate and rebuild, he is heartbroken and he cries out to God for God to do a work and cries out for the opportunity to be part of that work that God wants to do. And that's exactly what he's done is he's sent Nehemiah back now under the king Artaxerxes to be the governor of this area. And Nehemiah gets back, waits a couple days, rests up a little bit, but then takes his own counsel, takes some time to look at the rubble for himself and see exactly what he has to work with and exactly what needs to be done and then gathers the people together and tells them, I need you to look at this. You know, this city that you've lived in for the last 10, 20, 30 years, I need you to look at this. You know, this rubble that you've been stepping over, this rubble that you've landscaped around, these broken gates that you just have have stopped seeing, I need you to see it again. And I need you to understand that the world is looking at this city and the world doesn't see truth about our God. And that matters to me and I know it matters to you. And let me tell you, God is at work 
And God's good hand has been on me. And God has prospered me to come back for this purpose. And he's used the king, Artaxerxes, to fund this effort. And I want us to rise up and build this city so that we will no longer be a reproach. So that when people look at us, they see better truth about God. And we talk about a miraculous work. And I mentioned last week, I think this is one of the most miraculous works of God that you'll see in Scripture. The people as a whole responded with a heart that said, yes, let's do it. And they strengthened their hand for this good work. And the first people we see are the priests. And they're by the sheep gate, which kind of makes sense. This is where we would bring in the sacrifices for worship. And what you're going to see as we go through this is that People are going to be work, working, very, very many of them, working in places that they have particular interest, some even right in front of their own homes. But that brings to mind this principle for us to consider today. It's a principle that we need to consider, and we'll get some truth from this as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. But Paul writing to believers in Jesus Christ in the city of Corinth, makes a statement to them. They've been divided over who's most important, and I'm following Paul, or I'm following Apollos, and Paul is saying, you guys are just, your, your, your focus is wrong. You're divided, and you're envious of one another, and there's conflict with each other, and this is not what should be true. He asks in verse 9, or says in verse 9, we are laborers together with God. Myself, Apollos, you, all of us are laboring together with God. We're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, his field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which he's given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ. For you and for me, as we think about rebuilding a life, I want us to consider it's very easy for us to look at my individual picture and my individual life, and we have to start where we are. We've spent a lot of time talking about that, but we need to understand what our life is really built on and what we're really about. So could I ask you to consider first why you build? We're at a place in our life where I say, it's time for me to rebuild. Why? Because life is going really bad, and I don't like it to go bad, and I want it to go better. Well, yeah, that's not a bad reason. But if that's the only reason, it's not going to be sufficient to get us where we need to be. And it's not going to be sufficient for the work that God wants to do. Consider why you build. Are you building for God's glory? As we've said, that's what motivated Nehemiah more than anything else. We'll see this a little bit further on as we spend some time looking more specifically at Nehemiah personally. But Nehemiah, when he heard about the state of the city of Jerusalem, was in the perfect place to say, eh, boy, that's too bad, and just go about his life. He was in a privileged place, in a privileged position, he was at a good spot, good place in his life. He was 1,100 miles away. Would have been easy for Nehemiah to say that's somebody else's problem. That's for somebody else to deal with. What was it that motivated him to uproot and risk his neck in front of the king and uproot and make that journey and put this responsibility, carry this responsibility on himself? He wanted to see the glory of God shine from the city of Jerusalem, and he wanted it so badly he was going to devote himself to that purpose. It doesn't take any relationship with God at all for you and for me to look at our lives, be dissatisfied, and say, how can I make this better? But I would ask you, are you living your life with a conscious desire to say, I want the world around me to know that there is a God in heaven and that it's not me and that it's not them and that this God is worthy of trust and this God is worthy of worship. And I want my life to point people in that direction. 
Whatever efforts you're undergoing right now to rebuild your life, I want you to understand that you can take a lot of good steps and a lot of wise steps, and the more we do things according to the wisdom that God gives us, the more we work according to the way God's universe is designed, the better things tend to work, generally speaking. But I want you to understand, until we realize and understand that God himself is the greatest mission I can be involved with, we are always going to come up short. We are always going to miss out on true contentment, true satisfaction. It's got to be God himself. Is that why you're building? Is that your life? Is that what it's for? Is that what it's about? Are you building for God's glory? Consider why you build. Build for God's glory. I want to take another step here and ask us to consider this. We just read from 1 Corinthians 3 as Paul is talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Build for God's glory. Build for Christ's church. Are those two separate things? No, but we're getting more specific. Think about the songs that we've sung this morning. Focusing on the church of Jesus Christ. Think about what we read from Ephesians chapter 3. As Paul helps us to understand, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the Old Testament and there's something you don't see there clearly. It's because God didn't reveal it yet. And that's this idea of the church. And it is through the church that he wants to display his wisdom to the world and to the spiritual powers that be. He wants his wisdom on display in the church. You know, one of the things I'm challenged by as I look at Nehemiah and reminded of as I look at Nehemiah, if you go back up there quickly to Nehemiah 2 where we were or where I mentioned as he is approaching the people and he says in verse 17 of Nehemiah 2, you see the distress we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste, the gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. And they said, let us rise up and build. See, there was no, nothing wrong at all with Nehemiah's vision here. It was dead on. And the purpose and desire that he had was God-given. But Nehemiah did not come into Jerusalem and say, all right, you guys, get out of the way. I'm going to rebuild this wall. Because Nehemiah understood full well. He can't. We must. Nehemiah knew that no matter how much effort or time or wisdom he threw at this project, if he was in there by himself, it was never going to happen. Because it's too big. It's too big. It's always bigger than one person. And for you and me to consider, I always want to be a little bit careful here and help us to point out and understand, when we read the Old Testament and read about the nation of Israel, one of the things that, that is important for us to remember is that the nation of Israel is not the New Testament church. And the New Testament church is not the nation of Israel. So we do have to do a little math in our heads, if you will, as we're reading the Old Testament. And remember, we need to understand what God was saying to those people, where they were at that time, and there are principles that apply to you and me today as we understand how these truths relate to us in our time. So as we look at Nehemiah rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, we understand that is where God had told the nation of Israel, I will set my name there. That is where he established the worship of his temple. And eventually, as the temple is rebuilt, and for a few hundred years, as sacrifices resume and all those things continue, it was at the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that that big curtain in the middle of the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place, where the high priest alone could get access to God once a year on the Day of Atonement, it was at the death of Jesus Christ and his cry that it's finished, that that curtain was torn in two and the way to God is open through Jesus Christ. We don't need the temple anymore because Jesus has done what he alone can do. Jesus has done what all those animal sacrifices pointed to war. And so you are no longer born physically into the church of Jesus Christ as someone would be born physically into the nation of Israel. We enter the church of Jesus Christ. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son by repentance and faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have to be born from above. My dad was a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home. 
So what standing does that give me before God? The same standing I had the day I was born. Sinner separated from him. Until that point where I understood enough to know Jesus died for me. I need him to do what he alone can do. A turning in the heart that said it has to be God and not me. A crying out from the heart that says, I need Jesus to forgive me. I need Jesus to make me right with him. I need Jesus to show his mercy to me because I don't deserve it, but I need it. I had to be born from above. And being born from above, I'm placed into relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'm placed into relationship with those who belong to Jesus Christ. See, that's, that's, that's a church. Where do we see that on display? Well, you're, you're not going to see the, the whole church at once. Why? Well, a bunch of us are in heaven already. But where do we get to see that on display? Well, in a place like this, where we gather together on purpose, covenant together intentionally and say, we're Christ's church here in Silver Lake. So as we read about Nehemiah and Jerusalem and the people of the Old Testament, we are talking about a man who follows God and believes God and the people who follow God and believe God and who God covenants to work with. But understand that's a distinction from who we are today as the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. We need to keep those things distinct in our minds. But doing so, it is really easy to see a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities in the physical work of rebuilding Jerusalem's wall that take place in the work of Jesus as he builds his church and in the practical shape that takes as people join together involved in the ministry of a visible local church. So if we can keep those distinctions straight, we can learn some good truths here today. Building for Christ's church. Again, Nehemiah can't do this by himself. It takes the people of the city to see the need, to see the mission, and to own that together and to strengthen their hands for the work to be accomplished. It doesn't matter how much people appreciated Nehemiah. It it wouldn't matter how much people gathered around and said, Nehemiah, we're so glad you're here. Nehemiah, we appreciate so much the effort that you're putting in. Nehemiah, we love the way that you're just giving yourself to this task. If they don't pick up trowels and start the work, nothing gets done. And I would ask you, as you consider where you are in your life right now and the efforts that are being made to rebuild and change direction, Where does the church of Jesus Christ fit in? And do you realize that's not even the right question? See, if you are in Jesus Christ, you are connected to those who belong to him. And what you're going to have a difficult time finding in the New Testament is those who were believers in Jesus Christ, but just kind of wandered around by themselves. When we read through the New Testament, the one another commands. Every one of those one another commands exists in the context of people who are gathered together and know each other's names. When Paul told the believers in Colossae to love one another, they knew who the others were. It was these people right around me. When Jesus said, when when Paul tells us in Ephesians that Jesus gave gifts to men, he gave gifts to his church, he gave pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. If you are seeking to rebuild in your life, you need to understand that you need to be built on the foundation of the person of Jesus Christ. You need to have a right relationship with God through Jesus alone. That's where it starts. And if you are connected to Jesus Christ, you are connected to those that are his, and you need to live that out in practical, visible connection to other real believers in a real place. A lot of practicalities to figure out how does that work? What's the best way for that to happen? But that has to be the pursuit that you have in mind. 
I'll say too, I love the fact that we have guests with us today. I love the fact that we have people who come and kind of stay for a while and look things around. And especially in our world today, you need to take some time to look at a church before you just walk in and say, okay, we're here. You need to look at it. Absolutely. But we need to understand that we need to come into a church looking to say, God has a place for me to serve him. God has someone for me to serve. God has a purpose for me, and I'll find that in the context of a body of believers. I come to a church looking for how God will use me, not primarily, well, what will this church give me? We could spend a lot more time there, won't this morning, but consider why you're building. Are you building for God's glory? Build for God's glory. Build for Christ's glory. Church, do you understand that is where you want to see the glory of God at work? God said, that's why I created the church. That's why I designed the church. Because I want to display my wisdom to the world and to the spiritual powers that exist. Well, how does he do that in a church? Well, think about the way the gospel actually works. It takes people who are all about themselves and turns their focus to God and to those around them. It brings people together who have nothing else in common except the fact that we have both experienced the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And we want that to be seen in someone else. So we don't have to have been born in the same place. We don't have to have the same dietary preferences. We don't have to root for the same football team or any football team. We don't even necessarily have to vote the same way. Can I say that out loud? We start with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our world can't do that. Our world can't do that. Our society can't do that. Our society today is built around, you build according to your tribe. You build according to your skin color. You build according to your class. You build according to your preferences. You build according to the desires that you have in your heart. You find other people that have the same desires. And you build according, you group according to that. Jesus says, no, no, in, in the cross of Jesus Christ, there is equal spiritual standing before God. There's, there's no spiritual difference between men and women, between those who are born free and those who have been enslaved, between those who are from this country or that country, between those who are born Jews and those who are born Gentiles. Jesus Christ levels that. He makes us one in him. The world can't do that. When the world sees that being pulled off, something's different. Are you building for God's glory? Are you building for Christ's church? I challenge you, you're not going to do the first one if you're not working as well as you, if, if you're not working on the second one. Build for God's glory. Build for Christ's church. Build for others. Where are we seeing all this in Nehemiah 3? Well, again, there's a distinction with the Old Testament people of Israel and the New Testament church. But what we see in Nehemiah 3 is people building for God's glory. That's the purpose and the motivation of what they're doing. They're building for God's glory and God's people. And one of the things we see all the way through here is people are not just building for themselves, but they're building for one another. As you take some time and go through, you're going to see one of the things that you'll see if you take some time and go through and look at these lists is people from Jerusalem, yes, but you'll see people from a lot of places. You'll see people from Jordan. You'll see people from Tekoa. You'll see people who live in other places. Now think about that. It's one thing if I and my family are living here in this city of Jerusalem with the walls broken down. I have a high motivation to say, let's get these walls built and get me some protection. But it's pretty amazing when somebody who lives several miles away is going to come into a city and say, I want to help see these walls built, and, well, my house is over there. I won't be inside these walls. Can I challenge you to consider what our world tells us to do today is look at yourself and look at your desires and start from there. And God tells us, no, look at God's glory and start from there. And then look at the way God's love has been shown to you. And you need to desire to share that love with one another. And I will challenge you to consider some of the best 
building you will ever do in your life will be that which you build into someone else for their good and for their benefit. Again, that's not something our world is big on. Or a world will say, yeah, do for others, but why? Well, it makes me feel good. But what if I can desire to see God do good work in the life of someone else because I have seen God do good work in me? And I want to share what he's given. Consider why you build. Are you building for God's glory? Build for God's glory. Build for Christ's glory. Church, build for others. It's one of the reasons people get so depressed and so down because I'm so focused on me. The guy said, I'm focused about me and how I feel and how I feel about how I feel. But I think it was Ted Tripp who said, no, it wasn't Ted Tripp. He's quoted this. It's been said many times, but... Um, a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. Paul would remind us as we read in Romans that no one lives to himself. No one dies to himself. He tells us in Romans that those who are in Jesus Christ are members of each other. We're connected to each other. And as we think about considering why you build and building for God's glory, building for Christ's church, building for others can remind you that the imagery that Paul uses in Ephesians about the church as being a body and that the body parts supply to other body parts. We've got a lot of medical people in our church with an understanding, and, and, and I think they back me up on this. There's not a single cell in the entire human body that is designed in such a way that it is designed only to consume from other parts of the body. Every cell in our body is designed to do something that contributes to the, bed, to, the, to the body. And God has designed his church, his body, with parts that minister to him, to one another, for the benefit of the body. Consider why you build. Build for God's glory. Build for Christ's church. Build for others. Some broad principles here. What do we see here in the chapter a little more specifically? This is where we get a little more practical for you and for me, I hope before we're done here this morning. Consider why you build, and let's consider how you build. Consider how you build. Just three quick thoughts here today. First, build as if your work matters, because it does. We spent time talking about this at the very beginning. All these names of all these people that you've never heard of, but had it not been for these hundreds of, if not thousands of people involved in this project, it never would have happened. We do not have, even from God, a complete listing of every person who did everything. But everything that went into this wall mattered because everything was part of getting this wall completed. And for you and for me, no matter how small you think your contribution may be right now, you need to work for God's glory, for Christ's church, for others, as if what you do matters. Because it actually does. It actually does. You have no idea how God will use that simple act of obedience that simple step of trust in Him, that one time when you choked down that fear and stepped out in obedience to do that simple thing that God asked you to do, that God impressed upon your heart to do, you don't know how He's going to use that at some point in the future. Work, build, as if your work matters, because it actually does. It actually does matter. We can see that as we read all the way through these accounts here in Nehemiah chapter 3. Um, my wife's folks are here today from, from Colorado, and, and I think about their church out there in Westminster, Tri-City Baptist Church. Some of you have been there. And um, what, what most of you have probably missed when you get in there in the foyer is there's a large plaque in that foyer with my name on it because of my involvement in the building of that building. See, before that building was built, 
or as the building was being built, they put that initial layer of block all the way around and I had five gallon buckets of sealer and a paint roller and I went all the way around the outside of those bottom two layers of cinder block with that roller and paint sealer. There's no plaque. There's no plaque. In fact, if you go there and look at the building now, you can't even see that because it's under the ground. <laughs> it's below the level of where they brought everything. I mean, there's dirt piled up against that. You can't see that. Nobody there would know that I did that unless I told them. But I did that, and I know that. So the next time those folks walk into a building and there's not water damage in the foundation, they can say, thank you, Lord, for Cliff Hathcock sealing our building. That's silly. Yes, it is. But does it seem any sillier than some of the stuff that you and I do day to day? Or some of the stuff that you and I just decide we don't have time to do today? Or that it isn't worth the effort today? Or that person isn't worth the effort today? None of you have ever thought that. I've thought that sometimes. But build as if your work matters. Because it does. It matters to God. It matters to that person. It matters to what God wants to do in that person's life. Your work matters. The absence of your work matters. Build as if your work matters. Something else. Build as you know how. Build as you know how. And learn more. Something strikes me as we read through these verses. There are some different occupations mentioned, and I've got a couple of favorites as we read down through here and, and, and think about. It. One of the things you, you're going to read, verse 8. Next to him repaired Uziel, the son of Harahiah, the goldsmith. Goldsmith. Not much gold involved in those walls, as far as I understand. He's a goldsmith. Wall building is not his specialty. Wall building is not his profession. Wall building is not his avocation. But he's in there in the wall. How much did he know about that before the project started? I don't know. I mean, people tend to know more about this kind of stuff than we did. But maybe quite a bit. Maybe nothing. But we do know that wasn't what he normally did. But he was willing to participate. And was in there as he could. You'll read a little further down and you'll find the perfumers, the perfume makers were involved as, as kind of a guild, as a group. They're involved in building a section of wall. The perfume makers, if you're looking, Scott's looking for a building project. You guys are construction workers. You're looking for guys to come and help on your construction project. And the first thing you're going to check on a mes resume is, okay, how, how are you at, at, uh, at mixing perfume? Not a needed skill in that capacity, but there they were. How much did they know about wall building? I don't know. That wasn't what they normally did, but that's what they were doing because it was needed and it was important and it mattered and they were part of that city and they wanted to make it work. Build as you know how and learn more. As you approach ministry in and with a local church, there may not be very many things you feel like you know how to do right now. That's okay. Do you know how to be present? Let's start there. Show up consistently. Make it a priority. But when you show up, we got some guides out there on that bulletin board. Have you looked at the bulletin board in the back in a little bit? Did you gift today? Have you greeted someone? Have you sought to introduce yourself to someone new or introduce people together? Have you thanked somebody for the way that they've been a blessing to you? Have you followed up with somebody that you talked to a few weeks ago? Everybody knows how to do those things. See, here's the thing. With that wall building project, there were things that pretty much everybody could be shown how to do. Pretty much everybody could get involved in some way. There was something everyone could do. But there were also some things you'll read through here. There seems to be a distinction between those that were repairing walls in many cases and then some that were actually repairing the gates themselves. 
that's a little more specialized. Now you're working with wood, you're working with metal, you're setting things a little bit differently. So there are some things in this wall that are going to require some special skills and so, some things that not just everybody can do. And that's the same is true in a local church. But the reality is for you and for me, God has something you're able to do. Are you serving? How are you serving? How are you looking to be? I was asked years ago, looking at our church right now, we're very small and we don't have a lot of programs, Right? Normally when people walk into a church in the United States in this day and age, especially a larger one, they walk in and they say, how can I serve? And what they mean is, show me what your programs are and I'll find ones that I like that I can, or that I'm gifted in. I can plug into these programs and, and jump in and serve. And I was asked, okay, if somebody wanted to come in our church, where are they supposed to serve? Because we don't have programs. Where are they, how are they supposed to serve? I said, well, you know, if we're looking for programs, I, there's not a lot of place. You're right. But what if we came in asking this question? Is there somebody here that has a need I can meet? Is there somebody here that I could be a blessing to in some way? If I come into the church asking that question, how many opportunities are there? Limitless. Limitless. Consider how you build. Build as if your work matters, because it does. And build as you know how. If there are things you know how to do, can you use those in a way that's a blessing to someone within the church? And again, are there things to do on a Sunday morning in services? Yes, but church is all week long, isn't it? We're connected to one another all week long, or should be. So are there ways that you can serve that's a blessing to someone else. Serve as you know how and learn more. Well, I don't know how to do that. Okay. Can you shadow someone who's doing it? You know, what's, what's amazing about our day and age now, and, and I know we've got a lot of folks that aren't real excited about computers, I understand it, but if you want to learn something now, if you know how to use a computer mouse and click on things, if you know how to read, if you know how to watch a video on YouTube where somebody else does the thing you're trying to figure out, you can learn pretty much anything you want to learn. How are you building? In your life as a believer in Jesus Christ, how are you building? As a husband, as a wife, wanting to please God in your marriage, how are you building? As a parent, how are you building? As a brother in Christ, how are you building? As a disciple maker, how are you building? Are you building as if it matters? Because it does. Are you doing what you know to do? Are you willing to learn more? <clears throat> Consider how you build. Build as if your work matters because it does. Build as you know how and, and learn more. Build as if life is bigger than you because it is. Again, not doing a deep dive here. There's a lot, there's so much. I, I, I'm thinking about so many things I'd like to pull out here. But they're, 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 one of the big observations I have we've mentioned already is that this job is far too big for one person. Nehemiah received a lot of support from King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah received the funding that he needed. Nehemiah received building materials that he needed. Nehemiah was sent with an entourage of men and armed cavalry that was there to protect him. I don't know if they stayed. I'm, I'm sure many of them probably stayed as, as part of his detail. Many of them would be strong, burly guys. I'm sure they could do a lot of this kind of work too. But no matter what Nehemiah brought with him, he did not have enough in himself to do the work that needed to be done. It required everybody to jump in and be part of that part of that process. We've talked about that. So if you think that you're going to be able to just knuckle down at whatever it is in your life and figure it all out by yourself and get it all done by yourself or, well, we'll let Jesus help me. Just be in Jesus. It's bigger than you. You can't do it by yourself. It's bigger than you. It was always bigger than you. It was always bigger than you. 
Can I remind you that as the church began, it didn't begin with one guy by himself. Jesus left 12 guys here. Jesus left 12 guys taking the lead. There were a few hundred people, if you'll remember, that saw Jesus as he rose from the dead. This was always bigger than one person. You were never meant to do this by yourself. You always needed more people involved, and other people need you involved. We've talked about that. So, so build as if life is bigger than you, because it is. You can't do this by yourselves. Quit trying and link up together because we need that. But it's bigger than us in another way. I wonder, we're not told about the ages of all these people. And the wall went up, we'll see later, in 52 days. So everybody that's building right now is, is going to be a beneficiary, at, at least in the short term, of the wall itself. But what you're going to find as well is that the wall gets finished, in the book of Nehemiah, the wall gets finished at the end of chapter 6, and Nehemiah goes on for another seven chapters. The work that needs to be accomplished isn't just about the wall. God's got some work to do in the hearts of his people, and that work is not done in 52 days. That work goes on. And Nehemiah is going to go back to Artaxerxes and come back about a decade later and the work still needs to go on. May God deliver us from the mindset that says, hey, it's fine for me and it's fine for now. Because it's not about you and it's not about now. What God wants to do is bigger than you. It is bigger than your life. It is bigger than your lifespan. It is about those who are coming next. Do you realize sometimes that's why churches cease to exist? Because at some point the people in that local church decided this is fine for me and it's fine for now. And they stop thinking about what's going to be needed with the people who come next. Boy, it's great we get new people come in here because we have new people. We need the new people to come in and help maintain what I have built for me. We need new people to come in and help keep it like I have it because I like it like it is. It's fine for me. It's fine for now. No, it's not. God's purpose spans eternity. You realize that Hebrews chapter 11 talks about people who were commended by God because of their faith. And we've mentioned the first half of that chapter, we hear the amazing exploits of people who did amazing things through the power of God in response to their faith. But then there's a second half of that chapter that people aren't even necessarily named, just as in others. And many of those, the writer to Hebrews tells us, they died not having received the promise. They died in faith. They lived their entire earthly life and did not see with their own physical eyes what God promised he was going to get done. And the writer to Hebrews goes on and says, that's because God had something in mind for us. What they began was not going to be completed without us. Live, build as if life is bigger than you because it is. What are you building into your life and how are you building your life right now in such a way that someone else is going to be better equipped to serve and follow Jesus because of what you're building right now? Who are you building into right now who is going to follow Jesus when you can't follow him the way you're following him anymore? Build as if life is bigger than you because it is. Can I show you something here real quick before we're done in, in chapter 3 of Nehemiah? And verse 5, this, this always catches my attention. Next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but 
their nobles did not put their necks to the work of the Lord. See, that's what happens when life's about you. This work is beneath me. I'm too important for this. This is not mine. Let someone else take care of it. No, we want to build as if life is bigger than me. Because it is. As we consider the teamwork to which God calls us, as we consider the project, if you will, of living out the glory of God by making more disciples for Him, glorifying God by making more disciples for Him. Uh, we can't do that by ourselves. It's bigger than us. So consider, why are you building? Is it for God's glory? For Christ's church? For others? How are you building? Can you remember this is bigger than you? For you and for me today. See, God's the one doing the building. He's the one getting his purpose done. So let's join him in what he's doing. Join God's building in you. Join God's building through you. Let's build together. Let's pray.